anybody here looking for revival in our own hearts and across the land? Anybody here looking for revival? Lift up your voice and say amen. Lift up your voice and say amen. in the house of the Lord, isn't it, this morning? Praise the Lord. We're looking for the presence of the Lord to be in this place and to move in this place this morning, and we thank Him for it. Uh, if you are a guest with us this morning, whether you're here in this building or you're watching online this morning, we just want to thank you for joining us this morning, and I hope that when you came in, you were able to get one of our, uh, our guest package and be able to get one of these little things here that... Uh, our welcome package and get one of these connect cards here and uh, just fill that out hand that in back in the offering for us and just uh, let us know you're here and uh, just give us a little information on you so we can get to know you better we'd appreciate that and uh, some things that we've got going on here at the church that we want to mention to you this morning first of all our ladies get together at North Point is going to be on Saturday April 9th it's going to be at 9 o'clock a.m. And uh, it's going to be a coffee and comedy time for the ladies to get together here. And like I said, it's Saturday, April 9th, which is next Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. So make plans for that. And also want to mention that this month we are not going to be doing a men's meeting because of the fact that that falls on Easter weekend. So just a reminder of that for our guys there. Uh, next thing we want to mention to you is our Easter lilies. We still have that sign-up sheet available there if you're interested in getting Easter lilies. Uh, to represent and just to remember a loved one, you can go out there and just sign up on that. And uh, you can help us decorate the church by doing that. And then Easter Sunday, right after church, you can be able to take those home with you and, um, and uh, enjoy those lilies at home, but plus help us decorate the church there. Uh, next thing we want to mention to you is our Good Friday service is going to be on April 15th at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be a communion service. Invite you to come out here and just remember our Lord and the price that he paid for our salvation there. Uh, so that'll be on April 15th at 6.30 p.m. Good Friday. Coming up here like a freight train two weeks from now is going to be Easter. And then also that leads right to our Easter celebration. Our youth are going to be doing breakfast for us at 9 o'clock. I believe that's by donation. Uh, you can just donate and give there. If you don't have money to give, we still want you to come out here and be a part of that. Uh, but that's going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning for breakfast. We're not going to be doing Sunday school that day because of the fact that we are going to be having breakfast and want you to have that time to be able to fellowship together. Then 10.30 a.m., we're going to be doing worship service. 
And then the youth, or the children are going to be incorporating a Easter egg hunt. I believe that they're going to be having two different ones for the different age groups. Uh, so that'll be on Easter Sunday. So just some notes there about Easter. Got a busy weekend coming up there. And uh, so with that being said, why don't we turn around, greet one another, and we're going to get right back into worship this morning. Sing it again. The 
atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here And the evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here well, Let's ask the Lord this morning, overflow Overflow in this place Fill your heart with your love Your love surrounds us You're the reason we came To encounter your love Your love surrounds us
overflow in this place. Fill your heart with new love. Your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. We just want to see your glory, Lord. We want your presence in this place, Father God. Life's to be changed, Lord, both here and online. Lord, I just pray that you would touch hearts and souls this morning. Praise you. I caught a glimpse of your splendor out the corner of my eye. It was the most beautiful thing I ever seen. It was like a flash of lightning reflected off the sky. And I know I'll never be the same. Show me your glory. Send down your presence. I want to see your face. Show me your shines all about you I can't go on without you Lord When I climb down the mountain and get back to my life won't settle for ordinary things wanna follow you forever for all of my days I won't rest till I see you again Let's sing it out this morning Show me your glory Send down your presence I want to see your face Show me your Oh, 
Worship him right now. Lift your voices to him. Exalt his name in this place. Just to ask him right now, Lord, just to be part of you, Lord. Just to be more of you. To consume you. To be more of you. Just worship him right now.
back to our first love let the cares of the world be cast aside we cast our cares upon you O Lord we worship you Father, I pray fresh fire in this place, a fresh renewing, a fresh spirit, Lord. I pray that North Point be a saving station of people that are hungry for you. If people come in here and they feel your presence, they want more of you, Lord, in their life. Thank you, Father. We worship you and we praise your holy name. Father, we come with you for some needs this morning. Put them up here on the screen here. Father, right now we pray for Jan. Build a wave of Lord that's battling right now with an injured knee. I just pray that you would touch Jan right now. You would heal her body and strengthen her. And I thank you right now for Jan. I pray and thank you for that, Lord. For our Lord, who has uh, stitches in her head right now, Lord. I just pray right now that you would touch her and heal these stitches, uh, Lord, that she would be able to get out of these stitches and be healed totally, completely, and strengthen her body, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for Sandy right now, who is uh, home from the hospital, and uh, just needs prayer right now. I pray that you, Sandy, that you would heal her body and strengthen her right now. Lord, I thank you for total, complete healing in her life, and I thank you for moving in her life right now, Lord God, and touching her and healing her and strengthening her body. For Elaine, who's recovering from COVID right now, I pray that you would touch Elaine and that you would heal her body from COVID. I thank you for total healing in her body and strength right now in the name of Jesus. For Betty Buller's neighbor, Norton, that needs prayer for the virus that is attacking her body, I speak right now to that virus. I curse that virus in the name of Jesus, and I speak healing over her in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for that. We thank you and we praise you for that in the name of Jesus, Lord. And I pray for safe traveling for all those that are on spring break this week. A lot of people traveling right now, Lord, and I just pray that your hand would be upon each and every one of our family, uh, Lord, that are traveling right now. Bring them back to us safely, Lord God, and we thank you and we praise you for that. Let them have a good time, a good refreshing time with their family and come back here safely. We thank you and we praise you for that and we worship you, Lord. And I speak right now over our whole congregation right now, whether they be in this building or whether they be online. I speak blessings over their homes, uh, blessings over their health, their families, their finances. Lord, anybody here that needs a need right now, I pray that you would touch them in this place right now and heal their body and strengthen them, Lord. We thank you that you are bigger than any circumstance that we are going through. And we praise you and we glorify you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Uh, just a couple of reminders here. Uh, first of all, uh, just a reminder about our online giving. You can give online at hollandnorthpoint.org and just select the giving option and give that way. Or you can also give by any of these options that are here. Uh, we have the offering basket right outside the door here where you can continue to give that way also. And then just also a reminder, this is Mission Sunday. So if you have seen outside, there is the BGMC burial out there. You can give your change out there for that. And then also we're collecting a dollar for Men's Light for the Lost Challenge there if you want to give that in the bucket out there that, for that too. And thank you for doing that. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Pastor Joe. All right. Good morning. All you wild spring breakers chose to be in Michigan for spring break. Wow. Well, it's supposed to, it's supposed to get better, so don't worry about it. It's going to rain all week, and then it's going to get better after that. So how exciting, huh? Well, I'm glad that you're here this morning, here worshiping the Lord. We're going to dismiss the kids to junior church. Kids, you can go back. Go be with Mr. Don, Miss Renee. Have a great time back there. It is the beginning of the Easter season. Actually, it began about a week ago, but I don't know what you think about when this time of the year comes, but I think of springtime. Some of the tulips are popping their heads out at downtown and showing their faces a little bit. They're slowly growing, and they're going to be here on time like they are every year. But most of us think of springtime, flowers blooming, trees leafing out, grass is greening, birds coming back. But it's also time to remember the greatest event that ever happened in the history of the world. 
That is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He said, I passed on to you what was the most important, what was most important, and what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried, He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. Paul drew attention to the most important thing that he could tell them was that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's what we're celebrating this year. And I hope that you enjoy your Easter celebration. Uh, We're going to have an Easter egg hunt here. You know, you got candy and you go in the stores and you see all of the bunnies and all that kind of stuff. But let's not forget in the middle of all this that the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world was the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to start by looking at John chapter 11 this morning. We're going to go through the book of John, through the Easter story, through the eyes of the Apostle John. And we're going to start with chapter 11 this morning with a story of a man named Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. We're going to read his story this morning. And uh, he's a friend that dies and is brought back to life. And that is the beginning of the end for Jesus. It says at the end of the story that from that time on, the Sanhedrin, the the religious leaders of the day, began looking for a way to, to arrest Jesus and have Him killed. That compassionate act would so enrage the leadership of the Jews that from that point on, they would begin looking for a reason to have Jesus arrested and killed. So let's turn to John chapter 11 this morning and look at it together, read this story together. It says in chapter 11, verse 1, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man, Son of God, will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. The introduction of this story is pretty straightforward. It just says Lazarus was sick. Jesus had a close, loving relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He stayed in their home often. He visited them often. They were very close. They were good friends. And in Luke 10, we hear the story of Martha and Mary hosting a meeting in their home. That's the story where Martha got upset because she was serving everybody, and her sister Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus just listening while she was doing all the work. And she got upset and said to Jesus, make Mary help me. And Jesus said that Mary has chosen the better thing to do, Martha, and that's, it's that Martha and Mary. It was obviously a close and loving relationship, and we're going to see next week, we're going to talk about that Mary takes the, the uh, perfume and anoints Jesus' feet for burial and wipes it with her hair. They had this very intimate relationship, and they send a message to Jesus that says, Lazarus, your dear friend, is very sick. Now, why did they send this message to Jesus? I think the implication was that Jesus would drop whatever he's doing and would come and heal Lazarus. He had healed many people in his lifetime. He he was known for healing people. They probably just figured that Jesus, whatever he was doing, because of their close relationship, that Jesus would just drop everything and go go be with him. He He was not just a friend. He was a dear friend. Jesus says that his sickness will not end in death. To the disciples, it sounded like Jesus would re- that Lazarus would recover from his sickness. But, Jesus, but we know, because we know the end of the story, that that isn't what Jesus meant. We'll get to that a little bit later. So they stayed where they were for two more days, and then suddenly Jesus decides, let's go back to Judea. Well, this had an effect on the disciples. <clears throat> they said, but his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, Only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going to go there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. 
The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, then he'll soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant that Lazarus had died. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too with him and we'll all die with Jesus. Jesus says, let's go to Judea. And the disciples are amazed by this. They said, what are you going to do that for? They had just a few days before, they had threatened to stone him. Jesus had claimed to be God, and, he would, and if you didn't believe in him, you weren't the ones who were going to be God's children. He had said that plainly, and it got the people all riled up. And so it says in John chapter 10, verses 31 through 33, once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which of these are you going to stone me? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus was doing this all the time. He was equating self with God, and that's what got him in trouble. He said, I am God come in the flesh. That's important that we realize that Jesus is God come in the flesh. He wasn't just a good man, not just a teacher, but he was God come in the flesh. He claimed to be God come in the flesh. As a matter of fact, he did it so plainly that they were going to kill him. They were going to stone him with stones because he claimed to be God. He, was, he said that he was God come in the flesh. Why would you go back to that dangerous place? And then Jesus gives kind of a mysterious reply He says, Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. What was Jesus saying here? He was simply saying that the time was right for them to go back to Jerusalem or Judea. God's timing is always right. No man can change the appointments. He's alluding to his death that he's going to, going to have, that he's going to walk through, and all the suffering that he's going to have. But he's saying, the time is right now for me to go back to Jerusalem, to go back to Judea. He tells them, Lazarus has fallen asleep, but soon he'll get better. And the disciples respond, and they say, good, he's sleeping. Sleep is good. It will make him feel better. He'll get better from sleeping. And Jesus has to tell them directly, Lazarus is dead. But now that you'll see what, what, now what you see will cause you to really believe in me. He's going to do something that, that is going to cause him to believe in him. And Thomas says, well, let's all go and die with him anyway. Thomas was a very optimistic person, apparently. He said, let's all go with Jesus and die with him anyway. Then it says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to to him. So they arrive in Bethany, a small village that's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. I got a little map here for you so you can see where that is. You can see that there is Jerusalem. There, There is not even the whole city of Jerusalem. You can see the scale of a half mile. There's Bethany over there on the right side. And the Gethsemane is up there where Jesus walked to the garden. And there is the Temple Mount where Jesus is arrested later on. Jesus is arrested in in Gethsemane. So it's very close to Jerusalem. People just walked out from Jerusalem to have this time with Mary and Martha. And when they arrive, they find out that Lazarus has already been in the grave for four days. And they walk to the funeral gathering. 
Now, the Jews engaged in a seven-day mourning period. They still do this today, of which the first three days were spent weeping and crying. Very little talk went on. <clears throat> there was, it was expected that the family and friends would gather and be present, and they would just weep and mourn with each other. Very little talk happened during this time. If you read Job 2, 11 through 13, it says, it says that. It says, uh, when Job was mourning, it says, when three of Job's friends heard the tragedy he had suffered... They got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes, threw dust into the air over their heads to show their grief. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. Not a word was said to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words." So this is the kind of thing that he's walking into. Martha goes out to meet Jesus. She hears that Jesus is on the way, and she goes out to confront him. It's interesting what she says. She kind of gets in his face a little bit, and she says, if you had only been here, Lord, he wouldn't have died. Your timing was off. You didn't have the right thing in your mind, Jesus. What took you so long? If only you were here, he wouldn't have died. And in a burst of faith, she says, but I know that God will give you whatever you ask for. She, in the back of her mind, she has this idea that maybe something's going to happen. Maybe Jesus is going to raise him from the dead. There's this seed of faith that's there in Martha's life. And Jesus rewards that faith and says, your brother will rise again. Now we see human nature in here too, because she's being very cautious in her reply to that. She says, yes. Yes, I know he'll rise again in the last day when everyone rises again, that he will rise again. And then Jesus says, he makes this bold, unmistakably messianic statement that has been repeated ever since at funeral services. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Jesus confronts and confirms her faith. Who has power over life and death? Only God. Martha is confessing a couple of things here. First of all, she's confessing that He's the Messiah. He's the one that's come. He's God come in the flesh. She comes to the realization that Jesus is God. She is the one that first realizes this. And and, and only God could do that. And so she confesses that. Her reply is wonderful. Yes, I believe. I've always believed. You are the Messiah. You're the one that has come from God. She makes that confession that brings faith into her life. Faith is rising up to her. And she goes to her sister and she tells tells her the master is there waiting for her. So the story goes on. It says, "Jesus, Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha had met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Almost word for word what Martha had said. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. And they told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible Then Jesus wept, and the people who were standing nearby said, See how much he loved him? But some said, This man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? There's this little kind of drama, this interplay that's going on here in the middle of all of this. Jesus was just outside the village, away from the mourners. Remember that Martha had gone outside the city to meet him on the road to get to him quickly. Mary gets up quickly and rushes out quickly quickly to go meet Jesus. The crowd assumes that she was doing what people would normally do. They would go to the grave and mourn some more. So they follow her. They're going to support her in her mourning. They're going to weep and wail with her. They're going to mourn with her. And so they go out, but to their surprise, she goes and sees Jesus. So this whole group followers are out to where Jesus is. And when she arrives, she says virtually the same thing that Martha says. Jesus, why didn't you come sooner? If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus, maybe you felt that way when God didn't answer when you called. I want you to know God has a plan for your life. 
God has something that he has for your life, and you don't see the whole picture. They didn't see the whole picture yet, but they knew that they needed Jesus, and Jesus was there for them at the time in their life. His response to Mary's statement is hard, but it says Jesus got angry, and he was deeply troubled. Now, why was Jesus angry? Why was he troubled? It says when he saw her weeping and others mourning, Jesus was so moved by deep grief, it frustrated his very spirit. <clears throat> he got mad. Maybe he was mad at their lack of faith. Maybe he was mad at the terribleness of the sin-soaked death, at the grief that caused this dear family. So he kicks into God mode. This is where he just kind of, he kind of takes authority and he becomes, he becomes that personification of God. He's going to do something that only God can do at this point. Where have you put him, they said. So they took him to the grave and he arrived. He said, Jesus wept. And this caused a division among the people. Some of them said, look how much he loved him. Isn't that sweet? Jesus loved Lazarus. He's mourning with us. He's weeping with us. But others said, well, why didn't he come sooner? He could have, he could have, he could have healed uh, Lazarus. But the story goes on. It says, when Jesus was still angry when he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see glory, God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all those people standing here, so they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in graves clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. What a glorious end to the story. Jesus was still angry when he got to the tomb. It hadn't subsided yet. It's sorrow mixed with tears. I've seen that. I've, seen, I've been in funerals where people are, are grieving deeply, but also they're angry. Sometimes they're angry at God for letting their, their loved one die. Sometimes they're angry at the loved one for choices they made that led to that death. Sometimes they're angry at, at who knows what. They're just angry. They don't know what they're angry about, but they're angry. And sometimes they're angry at themselves. It's almost as though Jesus is going to say, is saying, I'm going to show you who I really am. Roll the stone away. When it came to push, push came to shove, Martha thought, wait a minute, Lord. Wait a minute. He's been dead for four days. The smell is going to be terrible. I don't know if you've ever smelled death. I have. I worked with the police department. We came across a body one time in an apartment that had been dead for several days. And I can tell you, it's a terrible smell. You could smell it coming up the stairs, going to the apartment. And when we got into the room, I had to step outside. It was so strong. And Martha is saying, no, wait a minute, Lord. He's going he's gonna to have a bad smell to him. But, he, but they obey him and they roll the stone away. And they said, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? This was aimed at his disciples. He turns to his disciples and he says, I told you, you're going to see God's glory if you believe. Then Jesus said, because they had said that when, they, when he said that Lazarus is asleep, they thought he meant that he was sleeping, and Jesus meant that he had died. He said, you'll see God's glory if you believe. So they rolled the stone aside, and then he preaches a prayer. He prays to the Father, but the message is those, for those who were listening also. Verses 41 and 42, so they rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of the people standing here so they will believe you sent me. This is all about Jesus. It's, all about, it's not about Lazarus, really, in any way, a sense of the word. It's about Jesus and his glory, that he's going to receive glory for raising him from the dead. It's still all about Jesus, his messiahship, his claim to be God come in the flesh. It's not about Lazarus or the weeping loved ones or anything else. It's about Jesus. And then he addresses the dead man, and he says, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible says that they all watched in wonder as Lazarus stepped out of the darkness of the cave into the bright sunlight, still wrapped in his grave clothes, but very much alive. You know, I... When we get to heaven, I, I really believe that there's going to be a time when we can go into a, a room and watch videos of this thing that happened. I want to see that. I want to see what happened to the I want to see the reaction on the people's faces as they saw Lazarus come walking out of that grave. And, all, and, and you know, 
the, let's note something here. In other resurrections, Jairus' daughter, the widow's son at Nain, they occurred immediately after death. And unbelievers could say, well, maybe he really wasn't dead. This one, there's no doubt about it. He had been in the grave for four days. They knew he was dead. They knew that he was gone. And the dead man came out, it says, hands and feet bound in graves clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. The burial rites called for the body to be wrapped in linens so that, they would be, so that they could anoint it with oil to kind of slow down the process of decay so they could get him to the grave in time. And they had wrapped him in those grave clothes and he came out wrapped up kind of like a mummy. And Jesus told him to go let him go free. And then it says, and it says, many people who were there with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this miracle. This miracle so affected people that the Jewish leaders decided to get together and they said, we can't handle this anymore. All the people are going over to Jesus. We're going to have to make plans to kill him. And from that moment on, Jesus was a marked man. This is the inaugural event in the last days of Jesus' life. From this moment on, it's a journey to the cross for Jesus. He comes to Jerusalem to die. And this was the first event in that, in that trip to the cross. Remember what Thomas said when they decided to go to Jesus? Let's go and die with him. Turned out he was speaking prophetically. He was speaking the truth. They were going to go to Jesus with Jesus and he was going to die. But the story has some important lessons for us this morning. I want to close this, this kind of draw this whole story to an end by pointing out two things. First of all, <clears throat> death has a purpose. Death has a purpose. And secondly, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. First of all, death has a purpose. Jesus makes an astonishing claim in verses 25 and 26. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? That's a stunning statement for Jesus to make. He's saying that death has no hold on the people that belong to him. Even if they die, they'll live again, and then they will never die. Jesus allowed Lazarus to die. There's no doubt about that. He allowed Lazarus to die. He could have gone to him and healed him, but he purposefully did not. Why? Because that death would serve a purpose. It would be revealing the Messiah, the God that has come to the world, and that he would raise him from the dead. That was the purpose in his death. That purpose was a resurrection that would bring glory to God. But in, would it surprise you if I were to tell you the reason and a purpose for death in general? There's a reason and a purpose for death in general. The reason for death is simple. The reason we die is because of sin. There's all kinds of scripture that says that. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. James 1, 15, these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. <clears throat> Romans 5, 12, for Adam sinned, sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone has sinned. We all, if you have sinned, and all of us have, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious sander, the end of the result of that is death for you and I. We're going to die. That's the toxic effect that sin has in our lives. So you need to prepare for that. We delude ourselves into thinking that as long as we don't commit the big sin, we're going to be okay. You know, as long as I don't, we say things like, well, I, I'm, I might have sinned, but I didn't sin sin. You know, I didn't sin really bad. I've never committed adultery in my life. I've never murdered anybody. I've never raped anybody. I've never done all the big sins. I've done, you know, I might have lied every once in a while. The Bible says that all sin is sin. All sin makes us fall short of God's glorious standard. But sin always brings death. We need to understand that. But there's a purpose to death also. That's the reason for death is sin. But there's also a purpose for death. Christians have the wonderful hope that goes beyond death, that there is hope of a resurrection. Death is not the final word. Death is not the final word. <clears throat> it is temporary and powerless for the believer in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Death is temporary and powerless if you belong to Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches over and over again that death does not have the final say for those who belong to Jesus Christ. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter devoted to the resurrection of the body. I want to encourage you today in your afternoon time, before you take your Sunday afternoon nap, read 1 Corinthians 15. It's a wonderful story, a wonderful teaching about resurrection and how we're going to rise again and how we're going to have transformed bodies. Too much more to get into it than there is to get into it this morning. But 1 Corinthians was written to the early church. They expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. They expected Him to come back in glory in their lifetime. They were all looking forward to it. But after a while, some people began dying in the church. And some of the old guard began to die off. And they wondered, what happened to those people? What's going to happen to them when Jesus comes back? And so Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15 to answer those questions. Verses 50 through 58, he says this. Listen to these words. These are powerful words for you and I. Words of hope. It says, What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will all not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever." Those who have died will be raised to live forever. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. Death does not have control. When that trumpet blows, we're going to be raised to live forever. And we who are living (coughs) will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. The purpose of death, listen to this, the purpose of death is to be defeated. The purpose of death is to be defeated. It cannot have victory over us. It will not last. There is a day coming when the Lord returns that Jesus will defeat death forever. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more dying, no more sickness, no more of those things, it says in Revelation, because the old order of things has passed away. Death's purpose is to die. Death itself will die. There's coming a day when death will be defeated, when we'll rise with transformed bodies and be with Jesus forever. That's our hope in Jesus Christ. Jesus made three bold point statements. He says he's about to raise Lazarus back to life, and he has just confessed to her the belief in the resurrection of the dead in the last days. And Jesus says, yes, I know you believe in the resurrection, Martha, of all things, but I am that resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He's claiming to be the God of the universe. What is he saying here? He's saying this. If you want to have eternal life, life that goes on beyond death, life that lives beyond the grave, you've got to believe in me. He's making a bold claim here. He's saying that if you want life eternal, you'll only find it in me. There's a desperate search today for life that is immortal. There are people that will try to sell you things over the internet that will make you youthful again. There are pills that you can take and treatments you can have and exercise more. And we find people over and over trying to extend their lives and make it longer and longer. I understand that. I'm, in, you know, I'm like Woody Allen. I say, he said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. So I understand all that effort to extend it, but they they ignore the fact that death is not the final say, that there is an eternal God that is going to raise us up and he's going to defeat death. So when death, when we go to a funeral, when we say goodbye to that loved one, we're not saying goodbye forever. We're saying goodbye until the day that death is defeated and we're together again and we're risen in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Only Jesus offers everlasting life. Beyond the grave to die with Jesus <clears throat> and death, die without Jesus, and death wins. It says in Revelation 21, verse 8, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You see, the Bible teaches you can live twice and die once, or you can, die, you can live once and die twice. What have you decided that you're going to do? Only Jesus gives us that resurrection power. 
And only he can let us live forever. That's why he follows up with this statement. Anyone who, lives in, believes, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who believes in me will never die. You and I are going to reach a time when we will never die. When that trumpet sounds, when we go to heaven and be with Jesus, we will never die again because we're with him. Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. And that's you and I this morning if you belong to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to call the worship team to come back up here. And then Jesus says at the end, he looks Martha in the eye and he says something. He says, do you believe this? One of the things that I appreciate about Jesus is he brings people to a point of confrontation. He doesn't just say, well, take it or leave it. He calls to ask us if you believe in this. If you believe in this this morning, if you believe in this, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You have eternal life dwelling within you right now in the form of the Holy Spirit. You're going to live forever. Your body might die, but it's going to be raised up again at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if you don't belong to Jesus Christ, you can make that right today. You can tell tell Jesus that you want Him to be your Lord and Savior so that you will live forever. You can do that right here this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word that gives us hope this morning. I thank You, Lord, for those that have lost loved ones here, that they know that if they were in Jesus Christ that we will see them again, that we will be together with them because you are the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you, God. We thank you and praise you for that. We ask that you would make that real to our hearts this morning, that we would live with that hope, that we can live eternally in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning. I think I know everybody that's here this morning, but maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure about that and you want to make sure that you're going to be in heaven for all of eternity. I want you to know you can do that just by asking Jesus to forgive your sins and making him the Lord of your life. You can have that assurance that he is yours and you are his. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand together, shall we? I'm going to say goodbye to our Facebook friends. Thank you for joining us this morning, for being with us. We hope you'll be with us again next week as we talk about God's Word in John chapter 12. As we talk about that, you might want to read ahead and get some head start on it for us. But God bless you and have a great day. Amen. And I